Thank you for joining us. My name is Carrie Smith, and on behalf of Cumulus Network, I'd like to welcome you to Unlock Your Cloud Potential with Marantz's OpenStack and Cumulus Linux. Presenting today will be Kamesh, Pemiraju, John, Jane Chig, and Nina Shankaran. Kamesh owns partner marketing responsibilities for the Marantz's OpenStack offerings. Previously, he was responsible for product management for Dell OpenStack Solutions. Kamesh brings his knowledge of emerging technology markets, broad open source experience, and a technical consulting background. He's also an avid blogger focused on cloud, mobile, and big data at cloudall.com. John, John is in charge of tech solutions marketing for Marantis. Nina heads all of the ecosystem software solutions. She has extensive depth and expertise in the data center space combined with business and technical acumen. The webinar will be about 30 to 45 minutes. We will answer a few questions from the participants at the end of time permit. For those of you interested, you have the opportunity to ask questions during the webinar by using the window marked questions. Simply type in your questions and click send. You can also tweet your questions to us. Our Twitter handle is at Keynote Network. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Kamesh. Thank you, Gary. Um, hi, everyone. This is uh, Kamesh Pemaraju from Marantis. Um, I will be uh, speaking for the first uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, giving an overview of uh, where we are with OpenStack, um, and also uh, a little more of a drill down into the OpenStack networking piece of it. So let's start with uh, kind of the uh, standard business drivers uh, of OpenStack. So if you're thinking, why OpenStack? Why do I care? Uh, these kinds of business drivers typically show up, cost savings, operational efficiency, etc. But then you would be asking yourself, yeah, but this is you know, what you would see also in any other cloud platform. What is so special about OpenStack? Um, so I think when our, our customers, when they make a choice for OpenStack in the first place, they're looking for a couple of things. Uh, you see the open platform and flexibility of underlying technology choices as two of the driving factors. Um, so flexibility of underlying technology choices uh, effectively means that they are not locked into any particular uh, vendor stack or particular hardware from any particular vendor. Uh, they have the choice of using their existing hardware investments or, or going with uh, even uh, you know, open, uh, open hardware architectures. So that's kind of what drives that. But if you look at the personas, uh, our customers, when we talk to them, we found that OpenStack benefits three levels of individuals within an organization, developers, IT or dev management, and business executives. Um, you know, obviously, the executives are, uh, are looking for the ability to innovate and compete um, and differentiate themselves from the competitors, and OpenStack gives them a platform to do that. Uh, managers in charge of traditional resources are typically just uh, involved in keeping the lights on with little time to create new services needed by the organization. OpenStack is a way to free up that time and move them out of firefighting mode. And finally, developers, who is really the target audience for OpenStack, uh, who are trying to build cloud native applications, they need access to server resources, network resources, etc., on demand. Uh, so instead of spending time running around trying to get access to resources uh, from their IT folks, they just simply request those resources to self-service. And that's kind of what OpenStack brings to the table. Um, so if you look at a day in the life of a typical Open, OpenStack Marantis customer, uh, this is kind of what we hear, right? Senior management wants cloud. They have heard about cloud. Now it's no longer a buzzword. People are getting benefits from cloud platforms such as AWS. Um, now they're saying that's great, but that I don't want to go to a public cloud. What else do I have? Can I put something on, in my own data center? And of course, OpenStack comes up into the conversation. Uh, and then the question then becomes, how can I deliver the same kinds of cloud benefits I get from AWS, for example, within my own data center, with my own IT team, and making sure that developers are getting those benefits and not having them run away and use uh, AWS uh, with you know, the classic shadow IT issue. Which is all great, but then the question becomes, um, I really need to understand how to manage this. Is this easy to manage? Is this, you know, how does the operational experience look like? How does the developer experience look like? And more importantly, I want to move quickly. Uh, I want to be able to manage and get this kind of benefits yesterday. So then, then, you know, then the question becomes, um, you know, okay, OpenStack is great, but what happens with OpenStack is it, it's a great project. The, the important thing to think about 
OpenStack is it's a, it's a set of open source projects. You know, um, at last count, and I've actually lost count now. I've been with OpenStack community for four years. Now we are somewhere in the 20 projects range. Um, aside from the, the basic services for compute, storage, and, and network, uh, you have identity services, you have you know, bare metal deployment services, you have DNS, data processing, messaging. I mean, every day there's a new project that comes up, new components, many different configurations. Last count, if you take all the basic services, it's somewhere in the order of 1,000 parameters that you have to manipulate and get right uh, before you can get all of this stuff working. Now, it's granted it's an open source project with 1,000 active developers and a six-month you know, cadence for their releases. It's all great stuff, a lot of innovation. Uh, but when it comes to actually getting it deployed and up and running, uh, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And this is really where Mirantis comes in. Uh, so we, we do two things, three things actually. So we, we take the upstream OpenStack packages, the open source projects, and harden them, right? So our goal is to make them as reliable as possible, as easy as possible to deploy, and yet provide the underlying flexibility, so with an open architecture. So uh, when you look at the ease of deployment, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, later in the, in the webinar, uh, you know, we have the, uh, a technology called Q Fuel, which is an OpenStack deployment and management tool, which allows you a point and click uh, way of basically deploying OpenStack from the ground up. It's hassle free. Uh, it's simply uh, a set of wizard-like steps that you uh, make some you know, basic choices and get your entire OpenStack deployment up and running, and all the complex dependencies being taken care of by that tool. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the reliability of the underlying code. So we do a, a lot of uh, hardening and validation of the packages, uh, and that forms the core of what we offer as a company. So we have the OpenStack distribution called the Mirantis OpenStack uh, software that we provide to our customers. Uh, we scale test it, we performance test it, we make sure it's production ready. Uh, we have deployed it in multiple customer sites, so we have validated architectures. Uh, so that's all we provide. And the other, the more important thing is the flexibility of the underlying architecture. We have a plugin architecture for Fuel, which enables uh, people to create plugins, you know, vendor and partner uh, folks that have networking or storage or or other um, uh, technologies can easily be plugged into OpenStack with this plugin architecture. And we uh, at Mirantis uh, help with supporting these broad range of compute network and storage technologies uh, with a uh, certification program uh, that gives you know, peace of mind to our customers that everything works together. So why, open, why Mirantis, right? So this is again going back to the pure play zero lock-in. So we do nothing but OpenStack. We do not have any other proprietary software or packages or stack that we sell along with it. No proprietary hooks or bundling. It's open architecture. Uh, everything is transparent to our customers and partners. Um, if people want to build extensions to Fuel, for example, using our plugin architecture, it's all available online. So you can check out what the procedures are. Even our certification program is transparent. Uh, we pu publish it on the website. You can see what the steps are. Uh, so it's, a, it's effectively an open framework for pretty much everything that we do. Uh, and we enhance the functionality of the overall OpenStack deployment through partnerships, uh, such as VMware, Oracle, Juniper, Intel, and many, many others. Uh, our focus, of course, is try to make this as easy as possible, point and click deployment with Fuel. And, um, and, and make it as reliable as possible. So, I mean, there are many ways of making OpenStack reliable uh, using, you know, multiple, um, you know, HA clusters and high availability backend databases. And we'll touch about this uh, in a little bit, uh, a bit, little bit later. Uh, but the more important thing is that we have hardened this with uh, experience at more than 130 customer deployments. And of course, it's all backed by Mirantis 24-7 support. So when I say open, Mirantis OpenStack, we are talking about the OpenStack packages. We don't have our own API. This is the OpenStack API. Uh, we are very close to trunk, uh, meaning the open source uh, projects themselves. There is no forking. Uh, it's just pure play OpenStack. Um, so just quickly uh, talking about the, um, the various products and service offerings uh, at a glance from, open, uh, from Mirantis. So the main, the main offering we have is the Mirantis OpenStack software. 
which is the enterprise grade hardened OpenStack um, packages that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we offer it in two flavors. There is the MOS version, which is the on-premise. So if you want to you know, download the package and deploy it and use it on your own hardware, you can do so. That's called the on-premise MOS version. But we also have a private hosted version called MOX. Um, so similar to the Amazon model, where you swipe your credit card and you basically get OpenStack on demand. Now, unlike AWS, uh, this is actually a private version. So you get your own uh, dedicated servers uh, for your OpenStack deployment. Uh, you have root access to the bare metal servers. You can do whatever you want with them. Uh, so it's really private in that sense. So you're, it's not really a, a, a shared, a multi-tenanted environment uh, like AWS. So it's, it's much more secure. It's private to your own deployment. You have access to all the underlying bare metal services. So that's MOX. We find a lot of uh, customers uh, want to kick tires on OpenStack. That's a great way to get started. And uh, they can put their workloads, test them out, see how it works. And then um, at some point in the future, move over to the, uh, to the private version, on-premise version. And of course, it's all based on known working reference architectures that we have hardened and validated with multiple customers. Uh, we have a very popular OpenStack training and certification program. Uh, it's four years in the making. Uh, the, the, the very important point here is that it's completely vendor free. It's, it's actually training about OpenStack, not about any particular vendor's operating system or any particular distribution. We don't talk about any of Maranta's stuff in this training. You learn about OpenStack, how it works, what the various components are, you know, down deep into the hands-on um, you know, operations and instructions on how to use it, deploy it, and the various uh, aspects of OpenStack. Uh, we have locations, 70 locations worldwide for training. Uh, we have trained over 5,000 people so far and certified them on OpenStack. Um, and you know, we have traditionally been very, very strong with solution and engineering services. Uh, we started as a consulting services company, uh, and we are probably the one company that has the most OpenStack expertise under one umbrella. Um, so everything from architecture, design, deployment, uh, development, and integration of drivers, certification, all that falls under that, under that umbrella. And of course, the, the whole idea behind Marantis OpenStack is the, the bits themselves are free. They're open source. You can download and use them. Um, but then if you want to go into production, you can um, use Marantis as a technical support. So we provide expert assistance with deployment. Uh, we also help with issue resolution and defect fixes. And we have premium and basic support options as well. Uh, so, so that's just a, at a quick glance what we do uh, uh, from in terms of the offerings. So let's kind of delve deeper into the networking aspect of it. So for those of you who may not know about the history of uh, networking in OpenStack, it kind of started off with uh, Nova networking uh, back in the Folsom release. I mean, it, it, it came, it was there even earlier, it was called Nova networking. It was part of the compute project or the Nova project. Uh, but it was very basic, right? It had uh, simple VLANs, uh, and it had a uh, flat DHCP, uh, basically only two different services available. There was nothing, no advanced services like load balancing or firewalls or, or multi-tenanted um, things like that. But it, it worked. Um, it, it, uh, it provided a, a lot of the basic stuff that um, customers wanted in an OpenStack environment. And today, even today, uh, it's, uh, it's used nearly in all the deployments, OpenStack deployments uh, that we, uh, we have been seeing with our customers. Now, uh, there, there was back in, I believe it was Folsom, uh, when the networking piece was uh, taken out uh, as a separate project. It was initially called Quantum. And then you know, for some uh, name infringement issues, you know, got renamed to Neutron. Uh, in the Folsom release, there was a lot of development effort uh, to kind of take it into a separate project, and uh, and there was there were a couple of attempts to deprecate Nova networking a couple of times, uh, but there was no migration path, and the simplicity of uh, the migration wasn't there. So I mean, people are still using Nova networks. Uh, Neutron, on the other hand, has made a lot of uh, progress over the last I'd say three or four releases since Folsom. Um, so in Neutron, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of great new functionality. If you if you need um, things like load balancing and firewalls and higher level networking services, and your use case needs it, um, you know, Neutron is a is a great way to go. Uh, you know, besides that, it also has uh, 
you know, pluggable options. There's something called ML2, which is a modular layer 2 architecture which allows you to plug in multiple layer 2 technologies such as OpenV switch um, and uh, you know, Hyper-V or, or things like that uh, or Linux bridge. Uh, so all those, you know, it's highly flexible. It gives you a lot more um, uh, sophistication in terms of the use cases you can do with networking. But it's, it's still kind of not mature. So until Juno, um, you know, still there are issues around single point failures. Um, because there's still one 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 network node, there's still work being uh, happening around uh, making it HA. Uh, there's there's a, some production, but not a whole lot of production available with uh, with Neutron. Although a lot of the SDN vendors have to use Neutron if you want, you know, a, an overlay controller, for example. Uh, so you know, lots going on in networking. It's a very hot area in OpenStack. A lot of discussions going on. Uh, it's an important decision point when you're designing your OpenStack cloud. Um, you know, if you want higher level services and, and uh, you want the uh, flexibility and sophisticated use cases, then you're better off with Neutron. Um, but if you already have Nova Network running, keep in mind that there is no easy path from going from Nova Networks to Neutron. So that migration is still uh, a bit of a pain. Um, but you know, if you plan it properly, you can get there. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the history behind what's going on with uh, OpenStack uh, networking. Uh, so so let, let's look at the, you know, specifically now coming back to Cumulus uh, and our partnership with, uh, with the Cumulus Networks folks. Uh, there are a couple of different um, options, right, or use cases uh, as you use Cumulus um, Linux and, and Mirantis OpenStack. Uh, basically, you have the underlay IP Ethernet fabric. Uh, use Cumulus uh, Linux as your top of row switches. You can e either use it as L2 or L3 networking to the host. Uh, or uh, if you are looking for an SDN controller, uh, you can use Cumulus Linux with an SDN controller, uh, which is effectively an overlay, um, you know, encapsulation technology. And there are several different things. You can use VXLAN or GRE tunneling, etc. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, we at Mirantis uh, have partnerships with various SDN vendors, including VMware. Uh, we have NSX integration. We work with Midokura. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with Open Contrail for SDN controllers. As a matter of fact, we are just about uh, completing our integration with Open Contrail. Um, so you can use that as an overlay, and for the and then of course Cumulus Linux can become your VXLAN endpoint uh, at the top of row. So these two use cases are pretty popular uh, with uh, both Linux and uh, with Mirantis and, uh, and Cumulus networks. So just to kind of, uh, before I hand it over to uh, Mina, uh, if you look at uh, a typical kind of a network architecture, uh, the, the ones that we recommend, and Mina will get into more details here, is uh, you know, the aggregation spine and leaf architecture. Um, and effectively, at the at the bottom of all this is the controllers of the host, right? And depending on your deployment, uh, you may want to have, uh, you know, a HA um, control plane for your OpenStack. Uh, we typically recommend a three-node uh, HA control plane, uh, which which uses, uh, you know, HA proxy for load balancing and you know, uh, core sync, etc., for for keeping the services and and the nodes in in sync with each other. Uh, and things like Galera, et cetera, for database replication. So all that architecture for, for the control plane of OpenStack is already in, in, uh, in our reference architecture. And the same goes with uh, the SDN controllers. And really the way they manage their redundancy and HA depends on the partner. Uh, they may have their own control plane for SDN controllers, which could be one or more nodes um, for, for, HA, uh, for redundancy of the HA services. You know, the gateway might have a couple of additional resources there. Um, it really depends on what kind of uh, deployment you, you have. Are you going to be doing a POC versus a production and the scale of your deployment, et cetera. But in general, this is how it looks. You have a spine, act, spine leap architecture uh, connecting back to your core. It could be either layer 3 or layer 2. Um, so with that, uh, we, we'll take questions towards the end, uh, but uh, at, at this point I'm, I'm going to hand over to Mina to kind of go delve deeper into the Cumulus architecture, and then we'll take questions towards the end. Mina, over to you. 
Thanks, Kamesh. Uh, that was a very informative start. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping folks are curious on how we can start enabling them with uh, at least proof of concepts to start getting them rolling. Um, so for those who haven't heard much about Cumulus Networks, just a quick peek uh, here into why Cumulus Linux. OpenStack generally enables uh, you know, your very familiar data center architects to use any of your commodity server hardware to build several infrastructure environments uh, depending on how agile and scalable clouds you are trying to build. Cumulus Networks believes the same design principle should hold true for networking. So you should be able to uh, take a network device, configure it at first boot so that as an administrator you can quickly replace failed equipment instead of spending valuable time or resources troubleshooting hardware. So this also enables really interesting uh, support models that you can leverage to drive down operational costs. So when you look at the true vision of what we uh, Cumulus Networks is about, we want to simplify networking by adopting the principles that you see here from the compute or storage of maintaining the intelligence in software and truly having that hardware abstraction. Uh, both Cumulus Linux or Linux and OpenStack are software solutions that run on top of bare metal hardware which are very unique uh, compared to incumbent networking. And now both, because both solutions are hardware agnostic, uh, customers can just select their chosen platform from a wide array of you know, suppliers who often employ highly competitive pricing models. Now Cumulus Linux is uh, the networking focused Linux distribution. So it's a switch running um, it just looks like a Linux server with 32 or 64 network ports enabled, uh, giving administrators the exact Linux experience that you would have in an environment that you already are very well familiar. Um, our goal is to build Cumulus Linux just as a platform. So it is a network OS acting as a platform for apps to be enabled from a uh, very native Linux experience of, for complex applications. Now you have a variety of technology integration like and some of the ones that Kamesh mentioned, um, be it network virtualization overlay, or if it's security elements, or if it's any visibility fabric that you're trying to build, or any of the monitoring components, or automation tools such as Puppet, Ansible, Chef, and others that can potentially act like apps running on Cumulus Linux. Uh, we have a very rich ecosystem of partners going across the board, and some of them with very little help from us, uh, so essentially acting like more of a self-service platform. Now the interesting thing uh, that Kamesh also mentioned was about Mirantis Fuel. So when you think about some of the zero touch provisioning or how you are able to automate and deploy an entire stack, you could essentially have a plug-in for Fuel and have Fuel pretty much automate the entire rack soup to nuts without having to even go through uh, any manual configuration on the switch side. So Think about starting to build a complete stack with multiple tiers of integration based on standards with no vendor lock-in. And uh, OpenStack networking, whether it's Neutron or Nova Network, um, you know, Nova Net both have their advantages and disadvantages, but we have seen um, our customers deployed in production in the last couple of years have their design built around Nova Net, and now um, most of the ones who have POCs with Neutron are kind of thinking what's their next step from a migration standpoint. So if you want to think of you know, how is a switch going to be treated as a server, we built uh, ONI as our bare metal provisioning mechanism. Uh, think of this as an enhanced pixie bootloader, which helps you standardize and increase adoption across the board for all these ODMs or bare metal hardware manufacturers, uh, also sometimes known in the industry as white box switches. As a continued effort uh, to sort of adopt the disruption, we have made sure that we contribute only to open compute projects. Uh, we have over 19 plus, the last I checked, hardware platforms to our SCL uh, and provide integration pretty much to most of the SC and overlay controllers such as Open Contrail or any of the orchestration engines out there. Uh, we'll continue to focus on delivering the right set of solutions you know, for whatever operational simplification or uh, improving our efficiency there. So we maintain an active hardware compatible list. So as an end user, you can go check the hardware compatible list depending on which switching ASIC you are interested, uh, whatever, whether you want Trident 2 for VXLAN support or you are fine with Trident Plus or if there is an interest in x86 CPU architecture versus PARPC, most of them are PARPC, but moving forward you will see a lot of x86 CPU architecture platforms supported and I think right now we already have about four. Uh, 
Once we've laid uh, all the foundation for these robust, scalable, more of the L3 class under our network, we started adding platforms with the XLAN focus um, to enable physical and virtual network coexistence, more from a P plus V architecture, um, sort of increase platform debugging, and also improve uh, the visibility support. So what's the ideal network design? Um, so for most uh, web scale applications or large cloud deployments uh, tend to take a layer 3 routed model that you can scale out by adding spines and leaves or uplinks. Um, now clouds that would be used for say management and collection of big data which tends to be a sweet spot, a lot of data ingestion, uh, tends to have a significant demand on the network resources. Uh, other applications requiring a large amount of network resources, say Hadoop or Cassandra, other NoSQL distributed databases, um, all of them. The more spines and uplinks that you can um, that are utilized, so you provide more redundancy, more cross-sectional bandwidth, um, you make your failure domain smaller. So a layer three class fabric can be designed to be fairly non-blocking or oversubscribed. So from an east-west traffic standpoint, you have uh, full bandwidth is available between any pair of servers. You can achieve faster recovery with plenty of core bandwidth uh, if you want to re-replicate after the failure. Um, and essentially, the leaf spine network architecture also provides a consistent distance uh, across the cluster for a low and, and more of a deterministic latency where, say, every server is equidistant within a pod or is equidistant to other pods, right? So. In that angle, if you think about equal cost multicast or any of the ECMCs, what we use to send traffic across all available uplinks and spines. So standard routing protocols, OSPF or BGP, uh, provide a very simple failure detection mechanism and, and broad failures. Now, the network architecture for OpenStack data center sometimes can also follow the traditional hierarchical core or aggregation switch, also called a spine, uh, the access switch, also known as leave all within a layer two, while a single services rack sort of provides this concept of a gateway to the rest of the network. Um, and then the services rack essentially contains the OpenStack controller and can optionally contain, say, load balancers or firewalls and other network services. So using L2, using layer two also allows you either use of NovaNet or Neutron. Now the determination of whether well, how large can I go? What are the boundaries of layer two? Uh, how big a layer two domain needs to be based on you know, the amount of nodes within your domain, amount of broadcast traffic that you're trying to pass between these instances. So breaking, again, layer two boundaries may require uh, sort of like your overlay networks and then your tunnel implementation and others. Uh, what we're, the intent here is uh, to kind of give you a, a overview and a description, and I'm hoping that we dive in, in the future session for very detailed design considerations as we work through this. Um, now let's take a quick look uh, under the hood of the architecture of Cumulus Linux itself. It's a distribution of Debian Linux, uh, standard Linux kernel constructs, and user space. Uh, the user space is open, so it allows you the choice, and it really gives you the choice to swap out user space components as desired. Uh, the items in green that you see, the dark green, are standard Linux constructs. Um, all the enhancements, modifications that we make are uh, in order to make it work better with networking and we contribute back to open source. Notably, we've made significant improvements in Quagga, uh, also with several innovations such as uh, unnumbered interfaces for OSPF in Quagga. Uh, we submit all these changes upstream so that we maintain our core principle of you know, open standards and community enablement. Now the items in orange uh, on the right are not the open source ones. Those are the core proprietary component where we have code specific to the merchant silicon, which is broad counter, that cannot be redistributed. And that's the SwitchD component. Uh, what does SwitchD really do? In short, uh, SwitchD snoops uh, basically what's in the kernel and pushes it down to the merchant silicon to achieve line rate speed. So the action of what SwitchD is capable of is hardware accelerated Linux for networking. That's really how we uh, term it. So as an end user, uh, you have a plethora of benefits for leveraging uh, Cumulus Linux as your default OS for open networking, mainly because it complements OpenStack. 
uh, by delivering the same automated self-service sort of operational model uh, to the network and, and greatly simplifies your provisioning and operations. Uh, for example, our latest release um, now provides you a full validated design guide of how you can use something like Puppet as an automated uh, automation tool to not only provision the switch but the entire stack. And as we as we evolve from there, you will have very significant improvements both on the Neutron and as well as for our customers who are still in the NovaNet space. Being Linux, uh, a Cumulus Linux powered bare metal switch drives like any other Debian system you've used, uh, which means transparently it accelerates your Linux data plane uh, while preserving a pure Linux control plane. And so Alternatively, it empowers a wealth of tools that you already use for your servers, your virtual machines, and other appliances. Um, Cumulus Linux also offers, uh, I would say, a lot of capability, very powerful for deploying your complete stack uh, with ONI, which is the open network install environment, or zero touch provisioning for you to uh, automate all the way up to your standard Linux interface, or prescriptive topology manager, which is uh, essentially the one that kind of maps all your layer one connectivity and uh, helps you sort of this cable management through a dot file and also Pixie, etc. So in a sense, the combination of bare metal hardware with a consistent Linux platform uh, we believe will enable administrators to create fast, easy, and uh, affordable networks when you're considering OpenStack. So from a future direction, let's look at some of the work in progress to get you started. You have, uh, there are several things in works with Mirantis. We have a blueprint for you know, how customers can actually take Mirantis and Cumulus and consume that for a POC and production and large scale clusters. Um, we're also working on several collateral, several assets for you to leverage on that. There's also um, from a go to market in terms of a customer, how do I procure all this? Open networking is quite different. There's a disaggregation between hardware and software. So how do you get all these best of breed components uh, through a single mechanism of acquisition? So all of these are in works, and um, I, I definitely encourage you to use our workbench, uh, which is a cumulus workbench, which is a hands-on lab where you can try out things uh, for no risk or no investment um, as a starter and definitely educate yourself. Um, also, there are several assets today online that you can go and uh, learn in terms of how the OpenStack integration looks like. With that, um, you know, I definitely want some time to take questions, so I will turn it back to um, Carrie. Great. Thanks, Vita. Thanks, Kamesh. A lot of great questions coming in. Uh, first question, are there stepping stone strategies for using Cumulus and Mirantis um, operating system to build smaller scale clouds without fully realizing the cost architecture? Uh, this is John. Um, yes, uh, I, I think so. Um, OpenStack is pretty tolerant uh, of, uh, of multiple networking um, configurations. Um, as Kamesh said, you know, it comes out of the box with uh, uh, flat DHCP networking that is, you know, that that can be deployed on, you know, literally any LAN or a succession of virtual machines, you know, hosted together internally on a single laptop, um, but also supports uh, more advanced, um, you know, configurations up to the capabilities of hardware. You could um, reasonably build out a a, a, a medium-sized, a small proof of concept on as few as two servers um, with a. a you know, three NICs each in a single switch. Um, uh, or you could uh, think in terms of racks uh, and use top of rack uh, switches and an appropriately scaled parent switch, then build out the backbone capacity as, uh, as you want to increase uh, overall cluster uh, capacity. Um, the nice thing about being able to uh, work with, uh, with products like, like Cumulus and Mirantis OpenStack, furthermore, is, is that because of the attention being paid to uh, auto discovery and uh, automated deployment, you can um, uh, deploy and as necessary redeploy um, uh, as many times as you like uh, to, uh, to conform to architectural requirements as these change uh, and, and deploy subsystems like new compute nodes without uh, disrupting a, a current uh, installation. And back to you. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I, had, I was on mute. Um, next question. I'm not 100% sure where stuff like VPN 
um, ass and LB ass fit into this picture. Can you clarify? Uh, this is John again. Uh, you have VPN, specifically VPN as a service, um, uh, and uh, load balancing as a service are, are um, um, uh, critical network functionalities for, for building um, uh, next-gen um, web-based applications, which is sort of OpenStack's sweet spot. Um, both of these things are allowed for in, in the Neutron uh, architecture and in the current iteration of Lorentz's OpenStack can be uh, can be uh, started up by enabling uh, experimental features. Um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the functionality would typically be deployed uh, as, uh, as a sub-function of uh, an SDN controller, either the OpenStack uh, OpenV switch uh, default um, SDN or a third-party SDN, which would ride on top of uh, of, uh, of Cumulus uh, as an application. Great, thanks. And next question, fully mesh structures look elegant, but doesn't it imply maximum hardware cost? Um, this, this is me, I'll, t I'll take that one. Um, it's actually quite the opposite. Uh, when, you, when you think about what open networking has kind of triggered in the industry in the last couple of years, um, you see that fundamentally it's the hardware and software abstraction, and, and it's drastically made the hardware price very competitive and, and truly the capex has become quite attractive. So the fully meshed structure, for example, it permits use of uh, four, uh, four times you know, 10 gig ports to achieve better effective or better throughput than one 40 gig port uh, with your breakout cables that you can leverage. And, and the choice of 40 gig versus 10 gig uh, when you look at, can be around more of the functionality of the switching ASIC itself, whether you want to try to or Trident 2 if you need VX9 versus the decision factor being more termed around the cost because the cost difference is uh, practically a couple of grand, but it's no longer the 4X or the 5X cost that uh, folks were traditionally used to between the 10 gig and the 40 gig platforms. Great. Thanks, Vita, for that question or for that answer. Um, next question. Um, is there any app or agent in Cubeless which ta which talks to OpenStack? Um, no, so we, we don't have a um, because we're a standard Linux interface. We don't need to have an API. Uh, we don't have an app or an agent as such. Um, there is a ML2 plugin that we've uh, worked on from a Neutron standpoint, but our core efficiency is in terms of all the automation um, components that we offer and how closely we um, have the integration with our SDN controllers, with the overlay components, um, and the obvious DB integration that we have within uh, our Linux interface in order to work very closely with uh, OpenStack today. Great, thanks. And the next question, is there any documentation available online on how Cumulus can be integrated with Grit? Um, yes, yeah, so we have some uh, baseline documentation that uh, you know customers can get started. Uh, both, as mentioned, from um, we're working on clear blueprints as uh, design guides, so it'll help you more on the technical implementation as a step-by-step -step process. But if you're uh, trying to take some upstream OpenStack and just trying to play around with it, we certainly have some validated design guides to get you started. Uh, and I'm sure Mirantes can help you further as we plug along during these stages. Yeah, this, this is Kamish. Just to add color to that, um, you, you can of course get the Mirantes OpenStack packages from our website. Uh, you can download that. It's, it's like, like I mentioned earlier, it's not very different from the upstream OpenStack packages except that it's much more hardened and validated and it's guaranteed to work with support options. Um, so you could do that. And then um, as far as the SDNs that you would want to use, um, I mentioned earlier we, we already have integrations with uh, VMware NSX as well as Juniper Contrail. Um, so you can use those as your overlay and then uh, use, uh, use the Cumulus uh, stuff as an underlay and kind of use that as a, as a top of row uh, with VXLAN termination. So those are the options you can try today. As Mina mentioned, uh, we will be working closely together. Uh, to create validated reference architectures down the road. And you can go to software.marantis.com to get the, the Marantis OpenStack software. 
Great. Thanks, Kamesh. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mina. We're out of time now. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. We hope you found this presentation about unlocking your cloud potential useful. We'd love if you operate your feedback via the follow-up email. Please tune into our next webinar on February 11th, where we take a technical deep dive into Prescriptive Topology Manager with Cumulus Network's Chief Scientist, Dinesh Dutt. Or you can join us each week uh, for Coffee with Cumulus on Thursday mornings for a product overview and introduction to Cumulus Linux. Details are available on our website at cumulusnetworks.com webinar. Thank you everyone for your time today.